Hey art folks, it's Shade, and today I'm bringing you a review of A. Gallo watercolors. Starting off, of course, I'm just showing you all the lovely, lovely packaging. This is the dot card for the classic 12 color set. It's on nice paper. It has light fastness and transparency information in the back. And the dots are fairly generously sized. Next are the boxes that the palettes come in. I really love the packaging of this because it is both minimalistic, but also extremely luxurious. It comes with this kind of metallic paper on this one box and the logo is just so nice and clean and crisp but also beautiful with the design of the tree and the name it feels very and so in the smaller box i have a green paper and when you open it up there's a little card on there with information and a QR code. I think it's watercolor paper. And then the palette itself is in some tissue. So you open it up and then what you see is this gorgeous marbled paper. And I feel like I have to stress that this is not just print. Marbling is a very old artistic technique and there's very few people who have been doing it for a long time at this point and Alina partners with a family who's been doing it for hundreds of years in Italy and it feels like I'm holding a bit of artwork just being able to have this paper wrapped around this palette so from the beginning it's just a really nice experience so you slide it off and the palette is matte black and it has the same logo on it. It's beautiful. And this little tin is the Essential 6 Bet, which is a split primary pet. So you have on watercolor paper, a little swatch sheet, and the most adorable half pans. The half pans are all hand painted. They have the pigment information on them and the ingredients. I checked to see if the magnets work. They don't work so great with the paper around them. As you can see, they fell out, but they work pretty well once the paper is taken off. I haven't had any problems with them falling out or with the magnets coming off of the pans, which I've had in some other cases. These colors are just so beautiful and vibrant. So in the bigger box, Alina sent me what at the time were unreleased colors. Now you can get these colors in some of her newer palettes and these are different earth colors, which are absolutely gorgeous. So when you buy a single pan, you can see what that looks like. When you get a single pan, you still get a lot of care in the packaging. It comes in a little baggie with the same logo sticker on it and you still get a little piece of that marbled paper which I think is amazing and I have a little collection and I have to do something with them. I can't just get rid of them. I don't know what I'll do. And so they have a hand-painted swatch in the back. It's written and it has information about each of the different pans. The colors that I have are Lemon Yellow PY3 Permanent Carmine PV19 Transparent Cerulean PV15 colon 3 Indian Yellow PY110 and PY154 And I think this attention to detail is really great. Not only is there a sleeve with all of this information wrapped around each half pan, but there is a little bit of wax paper in between. So you don't have to worry about your paints ever melting or getting on anything else before they arrive to you. They are totally protected. And you see the magnet on the bottom and the pans are super shiny. Okay, vermilion red, 
ER253. Look at how shiny and smooth those are. And Ultramarine Blue EB29. See, when they're like that, they work pretty fine. They're great. So those are the essential set. I also have Verdaccio. Which is PBR7 and PBK6. Ross Sienna, EY43. We have the names written on them. Burnt Umper Cypress. which is PBR7, and Moralone, PR101. So, as always, we start with the swatching. The lemon yellow was so crazy because I had to try it a couple of times at first, because I thought I had gotten it dirty with some green. It is such a cool and hyper bright lemony yellow. I was shocked. It really is almost just like a highlighter. I normally don't like this color because it tends to be a bit opaque, but this version of the color is surprisingly transparent. It's not totally transparent, but surprisingly transparent. And it is so bright and vibrant. I love working with this version of lemon yellow. You know I'm a sucker for cool yellows. The dispersion is good and the mass tone is very bright and, and it has pretty good movement. Indian yellow, PY154 and PY110. This is our warm yellow. And I want to say I love the spacing of the classic 12 set because these colors go around the color reel in a great way. The colors are not too close together. You really get a bunch of colors that are very useful. You get two yellows, two reds, two blues, even two greens, three browns, and a Payne's gray, which is absolutely beautiful. So you can do basically anything with this set. So back to Indian yellow. This is a really beautiful, warm yellow. The dispersion is great. The two different yellows separate a bit when they're diluted quite a lot. So you have the main really orangey yellow part and then just like this faint kind of lighter yellow that disperses into the rest of the water. It's pretty interesting, but you only see that if you disperse it into a lot of water. Vermilion Red PR255. This is your basic red red. It is very intense. You can see that in the mass tone. You can get it to the sign of saturation that kind of looks like it's screaming at you. It's really intense. The colors that are made with the modern pigments are all clearly very finely milled, so they have a very even consistency, but somehow they manage to maintain their vibrancy. EV19 Permanent Carmine. If you're looking for the kind of quinacridone magenta that's going to burn your eyeballs like core or something like that, this is not it. But I really appreciate this color because of the perspective that it's coming from. There are many different colors. There are many colors that call themselves permanent carmine, but they don't actually look very much like carmine. When you swatch this color out next to a genuine carmine, you can see that the color matches very closely. That's a lot of the idea behind these paints is to bring traditional colors into the modern world using modern 
non-toxic pigments and I really think that that is so cool. EB15-3 transparent cerulean. So this is the same thing happening here. This is a phthalo color. You might expect this to be boom, knock it out of the park, but it's actually a very light color and the dispersion is not as high as I would have expected for a phthalo color. On the other hand, it is not weak. There are some companies that attempt to get this cerulean look by adding white. I'm not really sure how Alina does this in this case because the color is very transparent so I'm sure there's no white added. But you get this blue which is perfect for using in light skies and things like that when you dilute it a bit. So this is a great ultramarine. The granulation in this is insane. It's beautiful, it's deep, it's dark. It's a very purpley warm ultramarine. Up until now, all of the colors have been extremely easy to be wet. This one, at least on my dot sheet, required a slight bit more rubbing. I don't pre-wet my colors, so I like to see just how much effort it takes. All of these other colors so far required no effort at all, just a swipe of the brush and you were loaded with color. This one required a little bit of rubbing, not more than other watercolor brands, but considering that all of the other modern colors re-wet so extremely easily, I noticed this, but it's not hard to re-wet at all. This is maybe now my new favorite ultramarine blue. I love it. It just granulates so, so strongly and has such an interesting flocculation pattern that you don't often see in ultramarines. And it feels somehow very clean. I don't know if that makes sense, but it just feels very crisp. EG17 Chromium Oxide. So I've been wanting to try this and I've been a little nervous to try it, but every time I see this color, I think it's so beautiful. And I tried it and this is just such an opaque color and very heavy, but it is great for making natural greens, especially if you're going to be painting in plain air or if you're just trying to get your colors very easily more into a believable color range instead of a hypersaturated color range. The color is really easy to be wet. The dispersion is not very high and the opacity is just, yeah, it's going to obliterate anything for sure. Viridian Hue PD7 and PD29. I thought this was really interesting because normally Viridian Hue is just code word for phthalo green, right? Why is there a PB29? The thing that I thought was interesting about it is that actual Viridian has a slight bit of granulation in it. And so by adding a little bit of ultramarine, you get a slight bit of texture in this viridian hue. And I think that that is a really interesting way to go about actually being true to the name of this paint, instead of just using it as a code word for phthalo. EY43 Gold Ochre. So this is a yellow ochre. It is sort of brownish. It's Surprisingly transparent. It's listed as transparent, but when I first swatched it, I really didn't think it was going to be that way. But once the colors dried down, I could actually see the transparency. I'll be honest, and it's I'm very picky about my yellow ochres. And this is not one of my favorite ones, especially not just looking at it, but to mix with it is actually a lot of fun. This is a really useful color and not super muddy. PBR7 and PR102 Burnt Sienna. So this color was kind of curious because it was slightly chunky. None of the other colors had this characteristic, but for some reason when this color was rewet, it was slightly chunky. You can kind of see that in the texture of the paint on the page. That didn't really affect anything, but it was just curious to see in the paint itself. There is a lot of granulation in this paint. A slight bit of shimmer 
probably from the minerals in the burnt sienna. PBR7 Burnt Umber. This is a burnt umber that is pretty cool, but it doesn't go all the way to the extreme of the cools in burnt umbers. I enjoy the granulation pattern because I feel like it would be perfect for the skin of an animal. It looks somewhat like the crinkling that you get in skin or even fur. When you look at it in the dispersion, you can see how it starts off very dark, but then lightly feathers out. And I can see that being really great for some kind of animal painting or also rocks and landscapes. Haynes Gray PB15, PBK7, PV19. So I've been on a Payne's Gray kick recently, and this is definitely a beautiful version of Payne's Gray. It's quite dark, quite blue, not totally opaque and not totally transparent. It feels somewhat ghostly, like if you were painting some kinds of spirits or something, this would be perfect. These are the weirdest descriptions, aren't they? PY43, raw sienna. So this is the same pigment as the gold ochre, but it's very clear that these two colors are very different. This one is a lot warmer and it has a lot more texture to it. You can especially see that in the mass tone that you can kind of see the lines of my brush as I put it down. This one on the palette looks a lot more granulating than it ends up on the page. So don't be too worried if you feel like the color will be extremely granulating when you're mixing it together most likely it will end up being a bit smoother on the paper. The granulation really comes out when you use less water in this paint. Verdaccio, PBR7 and PBK6. So this is one of my favorite colors and I'm so, so happy that I got to try this. It is a sort of dull brownish green, very neutral, pretty opaque in mass tone very dark in mass tone, but it can dilute out. It's not extremely active in dispersion. I think it would be really easy to look at this color and think, what in the world am I going to do with this? But it is surprisingly useful for neutralizing colors or shadows or deepening colors. And even just on its own, I could see definitely doing a monochromatic painting using this color. And this is my favorite color. Actually, I lost my half pan of this and I was looking all over my studio because I was so sad because I just love this color so much. Morilone ER 101. And you can see in the swatch that this color just is not playing around. It just comes and obliterates everything. It's totally opaque and it just has this kind of beautiful warm bloom when you dilute it extremely. It's a sort of deep wine, old blood color, and it's one of my go-tos these days. In talking about staining, I think that these paints are extremely finely milled, which means the majority of them are pretty staining. To be fair, I'm doing these swatches on a color that I am not used to. This is a Clairefontaine paper. Normally I do this on a Fabriano Artistico. But still, the only colors that tended to lift a bit more were the earth colors and the ultramarine. All of the modern colors did not really lift in my lifting test. And they all remain extremely extremely vibrant, even after drying. Okay, so let's talk about mixing. 
These colors mixed very well and maintained their vibrancy. I did not have any issue with any of them becoming muddy or anything like that. Now that I'm looking at the dried swatches, I do notice a bit of sparkle, I assume. I notice a bit of sparkle, I assume, that's from some of the earth pigments that sometimes have a bit of sparkle in them. It's not that mica has been added, it's just part of the earth pigment itself. When you look at the row of the ultramarine, you can really see how much it granulates. It just adds so much texture to every single color that it is mixed with. If you don't like super granulating ultramarines, I definitely wouldn't go with this. And if you do like super strong and granulating ultramarines, this is your jam right here. Unfortunately, the row of Moralone is not particularly useful. I should have diluted it a bit more in order for you to be able to see the difference in the mixtures. But it is just such a powerful and overwhelming color. The Moralone and the Chromium Oxide Green create this absolutely matte, opaque, round color that is definitely nothing that I have ever seen in watercolors before. Looking at this mixing chart, one thing that I really notice is that you have a good mixture between colors with no texture and colors with texture. So if you definitely wanted to avoid texture, you could. But if you wanted to work with a lot of texture, you could do that also. You have a good range of very pigmented colors and more subtle colors. You don't just have one thing happening with this set and that makes it so versatile and so useful. I did a color wheel and you can see how easily the colors just run the whole gamut. I get a very true rainbow color when mixing these together. For the cool colors, I also did a little tiny one for the warm colors and you end up getting 
a sort of traditional old masters sort of colors with that triad. So I just wanted you to see the dot card after I did all of this swatching, which actually uses a lot of paint just to do the swatching. And as you can see, it really depends on the color. Some of the colors look like I can do several more paintings with them, and I have done more paintings with them. Some of the colors are nearly gone. The viridian hue is nearly gone, as is the gold ochre. But the chromium oxide barely looks like it was touched because it was barely touched because it is such a strong color. The lemon yellow is also nearly gone. But the Indian yellow is doing a good showing. So it really just depended on the colors and how much I needed of them. So fall is here as much as I don't want to admit it. And these ground berries were in the store and they were on literally every dessert when I first moved to Germany. So I wanted to eat them and then I thought they would also be a perfect painting subject. I love the paperiness of the husk outside and the beautiful warm berries inside. So I started out by just doing a little wet and wet for all the parts and just look at how beautiful that lemon yellow is. It looks like I have put on the saturation filter, but even in real life, I was just couldn't believe how bright these colors were. So while I'm painting a bit, I just want to talk to you about the A Gallo. So A Gallo is for Elino Gallo, who is an artist and watercolor maker. She's currently living and making these paints in Assisi in Italy. She works with tempera paints in her own artwork and she paints miniatures, but lucky for us all, she has taken her experience in working with historical colors and working with pigments and put them into watercolors. And that is really part of the aspects of these paints that I love the most. Because she's an artist, she has an understanding of the needs of an artist. And because of the type of artist that she is, she comes from a unique viewpoint of, as I said before, trying to take traditional colors and bring them into the modern world. So take them out of these toxic and non-light fast pigments and bring them into non-toxic light fast pigments. Her line is eco-friendly. They don't have cadmiums, cobalts, lead, or mercury in them, and none of the colors are hazardous to aquatic life. Part of the thing about this traditional viewpoint is that in addition to your regular colors like lemon yellow and ultramarine blue, you have these interesting colors like the Moralone, which is also called Caput Mortem. Or you have the Redaccio, which is made after the painter Serenino Sanini, and it was used for fresco underpaintings. And she's brought this color into the watercolor world, which I'm doubtful I've ever seen before. In addition to all of those aspects about the paint itself, Alina also works with her local craftspeople. The honey in her paints is 
locally sourced. He works with craftsmen who make watercolor paper, who make brushes, the craftsmen who make the beautiful marble paper on her packaging. He's also involved in her community and doesn't just talk about these eco-friendly things, but has actually been involved in education for things about, for example, taking care of our bee population. So sometimes people kind of wonder, what's the point of getting handmade paints as opposed to traditional paints? And I feel like it's things like this that make the difference. The unique viewpoint and the unique ideas behind it. Besides, of course, of course, this is also really important. Beautiful paints. And these paints are just a dream to work with. I really like paint that gets out of my way. I don't like paint that I have to think about and fuss with and force to do what I want it to do. And painting with these paints is like breathing. At some points, it feels like it's just too easy <laughs> to work with these. They glaze so beautifully and so cleanly and the colors are so glowing. That's a word that you normally hear when people are talking about the Sennelier paints, but I constantly kept thinking that when doing this review, these paints are glowing. And they just felt so light and airy, and I really wanted to have that in my painting. You can make these feather light layers where they're diluted so thinly, but you can still see the color and it still has punch to it. And you can also put it down thickly if you want and get that nice and opaque and dark. They're very versatile. I think sometimes people say, oh, you know, with handmade paints, they're not going to be the same as traditional paints. You can't expect the same of them. I think that these paints are literally some of the best paints that I have tried, period, handmade or traditional and I would paint with them every day. And I know that that is some high praise, <laughs> but that's really how I feel about these. They are just paints that will work hard for you. And they won't work against you. Whether you like punch of color from the get-go, or if you like to work in thin, quiet layers, you can get both of those from these colors. You don't have any problems with them lifting too much. You don't have any problems with not being able to layer after a certain point. If you don't want granulation, you don't have to have granulation. If you want granulation, you can get granulation. It seems like there's something for everybody. So honestly, as I was painting these ground cherries, I was just having so much fun. I think I said this when I did the review for Eventually Everything Mixes. Something about the paints just made me just want to have extra fun and play around. And that's really how I felt also when I was painting with these. So it's no surprise these are my two favorite and main watercolor pans. I think because everything was going so well, I felt like I could just try more things. In the painting, I'm using a lot of the Indian yellow, the raw sienna. Occasionally, I'm mixing it with morellone and the transparent cerulean or ultramarine to fill down the colors a bit. That lemon yellow really adds a brightness to everything that it touches.
Also, there is very little color shift to these colors. Another thing that's interesting is that instead of using clove oil, Alina uses rosemary oil, but the smell is not very strong. So if for some of you clove oil and some handmade watercolor paints is too aggressive, this might be a good alternative. Personally, I love both the clove and the rosemary. In the end, I added a shadow underneath the ground cherries using mostly Ains Gray and a genuine indigo. And those colors were just so nice and they granulated beautifully in the wet water wash that I put down. And I thought the blue would be a nice contrast to the warm yellows and oranges in the painting above. So if you're looking for handmade watercolor paints, I obviously can't recommend these enough. The colors are often sold out, so you have to be on your toes. Have you guys heard of this brand? What do you think? Have you tried them out? By the way, if you haven't seen, Cardin has a review of these watercolors as well, and I'll have a link to her 
video in the description below. I will have scans of my swatches available for my patrons. Thank you so much, patrons. I really appreciate you guys so much. And I really hope that you enjoyed this video and you found it useful. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I don't normally like saying this, but you should probably click the bell because I'm trying some different things with the times that I upload videos. And if you click that, then you'll be notified no matter whenever I upload a video. See you next time. And until then, be gentle with yourself. Bye.